Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that, covet, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now, brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Why does Paul feel the need to list these things out here and to speak of these sins so directly? Think of everything he has written in this, in this letter so far. Where is, he, where is he coming from? Why is this a burden on his heart now? Is it because he thinks that we forget so very easily how corrupt we used to be? And that even though we still do have to live in this world, we need to be reminded of such things? That we as spirit-filled believers so readily devalue the way that Christ has saved us? or that we have begun taking such adoption by a loving God as Father uh, so loosely and uh, taking it for granted? Is it because we, we are still such weak and simple-minded people that unless we are rebuked by such things that He strongly suspects that we will simply fail these patterns of sin and revert to these patterns of sin all over again? You know, I have, I have known pastors in the past, maybe you have heard some yourself, who will threaten and scold their people every single week because in, the spirit, in spite of how they preach the grace and the forgiveness of God's perseverance, they really do suspect that unless I remind them and nag them and yell at them, they're all going to fall away again. On the other hand, you know, I also know of pastors who are afraid to approach such topics as this and just hope against hope that their people are not going to fall back into that kind of sin. Not my people, not this church. We are too respectable. We're, we're too used to being Christians. Or perhaps it's because Paul knows that there are those who do, from time to time, profess faith in Jesus Christ and yet give themselves readily to sexual sins, to worldly talk, who keep their eye fixed on the prizes and the treasures of the world, but who still want other Christians to think of them as good people and not as hypocrites. Perhaps it's because that there are others who profess a belief in Jesus and who rationalize to themselves that dabbling in this corrupt world is really not a problem. Uh, we cannot, after all, avoid the world, that we have to relate to unbelievers if we're going to influence them in the gospel. Perhaps they and others just uh, that they include in their private world think that they have some kind of understanding that they will deliberately allow such sin into their lives long after their consciences have been burned. I read, uh, consulted a few sermons from others who have preached on this text before I put my own ear. And some pastors, as I anticipated, were predictably very tough on their congregations. 
painting how heinous these sins are that that, uh, Paul puts down here, drawing the strong line in the sand, requiring every believer to understand how dangerous crossing that line is going to be for them. I also read a sermon by John Calvin on this text. Let me read to you some of his opening remarks. Since we see that our life is subject to many miseries, and that as soon as we have escaped one danger, another comes in its wake, we ought to take the better heed to ourselves. If a man then, as a care for his life, will consider how to protect himself against cold and against heat and against all other inconveniences, it is necessary for us to watch, or else, when we have overcome one vice, it will be easy for another to steal upon us and take us unawares. For some are given to whoredom, some to gluttony and excess, others to gambling. In short, in addition to the fact that every one of us has a disposition to weakness and sin, There is not a man who does not have to fight against an infinite number of enemies. You can just picture their congregation, his congregation, can't you? You can just picture them, uh, the, the tension and the fear that was in their minds as they sat down to hear this text preached to them. You could just see that tension fall away from them, like lifting a weight off their shoulders. They're thinking, yes, this pastor gets it. I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. You know, in chapter 6, to look a little bit forward, Paul is going to say to Christians, put on the full armor of God. These words are given to believers, to those who know the beauty of their salvation that their help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, to those who trust in the Lord with all of their mind and all of their strength and all of their heart, and to those who long to be free from the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers and against the spiritual forces of evil that war against their souls, but who are not yet free of them. In this life, my friends, and I've said it before, In this life is where the battle is. And the bigger, and that battle, my friends, is bigger than you think, bigger than you even consider. And that is why there is only one solution for you to look for here. You must know and you must guard your own heart constantly and with vigilance. You must fight the good fight. Let me give you three principles that I think we need to always remember when it comes to the instructions Paul has for us here. The first principle that I would have you remember is what you tolerate in your life, you will compromise. What you tolerate, you will compromise. You know, Paul is being very deliberately general here with this list of sins. He doesn't have to be explicit. We we know what he's talking about. But the reason for speaking in only generalities is that he does not want you to be tempted to split hairs in your own reasoning power about whether this object or that action or those words you might give yourself to and think and conclude that really isn't a sin after all. You know, take sexual immorality, for example. That's the first in the list. The word in the Greek there, as you might guess, is porneia. It's the word from which we get the English word pornography. But immediately, you know, that word in our minds, in men's minds, seems to beg for a definition, for a category. Uh, What is and what is not pornography? And once we go there, 
it is much easier to tell ourselves that, well, what I'm indulging in doesn't fit that category, isn't quite there, doesn't quite fit the bill, and so it's okay. What I'm looking at, what I'm spending time on, what I'm giving money for, does not really rise to that level. But that word, porneia, in the Greek, was never meant to be understood in any technical or specified sense. That's the temptation to compromise that's going on in your mind. Scripture teaches us that sexual immorality is anything outside the proper and holy use for sex as God has created and ordained it. Anything. Porneia is all-encompassing because all else is to be excluded. We regularly review the moral law in worship here at New Covenant. You know, and every time you hear the Sixth Commandment read to you or recited, you shall not commit adultery, you should know that it is not a law that creates categories, creates technicalities. It speaks of a morality that is all-encompassing. Yes, adultery is a sin against one's own spouse. But that is because the primary principle holds up the institution of marriage as holy and good, as God ordained and empowered it to be. That means that singles anticipating marriage one day, maybe going off to college or living on their own, should be honoring this commandment in their lives right now. Not because they're mar married, but because they honor the institution God created. And by how they respect other married individuals and how they conduct their own behavior in anticipation, perhaps one day, of entering into that wonderful institution themselves. The principle you see is held up for all believers to see and all believers to heed. Hebrews 13 reminds us, he says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Very same principle that Paul is laying down here. Paul speaks this way about all of these sins that he lists here in these verses. He says it this way, he says, All impurity or covetousness, no filthiness, foolish talk or crude joking. And he's not trying to be legalistic. He's not trying to take away all your fun. He isn't judging you for any and all missteps that you make along the way, but He is confronting the real sin when you allow it to hide deep in your heart and you know that's what you're doing and you let it fester there. That is the sin of compromise. Tolerating whatever you want to be in your life just because you want it. Tolerating, as Calvin would put it, what you are prone to, what you are given to. Because of that weakness, something you are not willing to give up. Such toleration, my friends, is not a love for the Lord. It is a love for the self. What you compromise, what you tolerate, you compromise. Secondly, and, and, and we need to understand that it is dangerous to compromise because what you truly love becomes the object of your true worship. What you truly love becomes the object of your true worship. That's the trap of sin. Whatever it is that you've given yourself to, whatever weakness you have, you allow yourself to love it 
And because you love it, you indulge in it. It becomes a part of you. It becomes what you are known for. It controls your thinking. It controls your habits. It controls your excuses. It controls your lies. It takes up your time. It redefines your priorities. It changes your character to the point that you forget who you really are without it. All of that, you see, is the very definition of worship. You've heard me say before, worship is an all-consuming enterprise. We see, we, you know, we were all made by God to worship Him. And when we do, we are consumed by our God. We are drawn into Him. He transforms our lives. Even the instruction at the beginning of the chapter, be imitators of God. Do not just stand on your own two feet. Do not be your own independent person. Pattern yourself after God. It consumes us. When Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says he is already being poured out like a drink offering. And you should not think of that saying as uh, something that is in any way truly exceptional. Uh, listen to the whole quote there. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What, he, what was he doing in his life that was not any different than any other believer is doing in his or her life. Now we know that Paul and his calling as an apostle was exceptional, but his calling as a child of God was the very same as our call to be a child of God. We must fight the good fight. We must finish the race. We must keep the faith. Because we, too, will be poured out like a drink offering. But when, you know, in our old sinfulness, when we, we begin to think otherwise, it might start out as a mere harmless-looking compromise, but because idolatry has a life of its own, it's like a worm that crawls into your heart and begins to grow as it feeds you do not just practice your sin, you see, brothers and sisters. You begin to worship it. You will give yourself to it. You will live to protect it. And as you do, you will be consumed by it. What you love the most is what you will worship. And what you worship will consume you. If idolatry consumes your life, there is no inheritance for you in the kingdom of God. The third principle is, is that it must be the love of God that controls your life. We come back to the theme it is in, in verses 2 through 5. It's the love of God that must control your life. Ask yourself this question, when you live in this world, when you are surrounded by the corrupt and violent intensity all around you to glorify, to, to uh, celebrate the sexually immoral, the, the, the foolish, the crude, you think to yourself, what's wrong with it? Why can't I just enjoy a few things that the world enjoys or I used to enjoy that so many other people are taking part of and they don't seem to be hurt by it at all? Why must I live without such things that entertain me, that, that stimulate me, that, that touch me in just the right places? What do I do with this feeling that like I, I might be missing out on something in life? something satisfying, something thrilling that, that's passing me by. What is going to control your choice at that moment? What's going to control your direction at that moment? Under what conditions are you going to take the next step? 
How will you control yourself? What really matters to you? What must be protected? Is it going to be peer pressure that keeps you in line? All my brothers and sisters in the Lord will catch me. Can't have that. I've, I've got to maintain my, 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 my appearance. My reputation's at stake. Some legalistic notion that somebody's going to disapprove of what you're doing? Is that what controls you? Is that what manipulates you? Will it be guilt? You've made a promise and now you're breaking it? Just knowing that you should not be doing this, is that what's going to control you? Will it be a some sense of danger? Boy, if, if this is found out, I'm going to lose all of this. this those, they're going to, they're, there goes that. I, I have to, I, I got to stay away because I got to protect what's there. Christian, my friends, the best, the safest, strongest defense and security you have is to return to the love of God. You are who you are. You're going to fight the fight. You're going to fight. You're going to keep the faith that the Lord has given you because God loves you and has sent His only Son for you. And that is is enough. Nothing else comes close. Nothing else matters. When all the things that you are particularly prone to do move in and overwhelm you, as Calvin would say, only the love of your Savior is going to keep you complete and safe. Only when you return to the true fact that God loves me is it going to make any difference in your life at all? No amount of resolve on your part, you know, no amount of fencing around the, the world so you're not, you're protected from it. No, account, no amount of accountability is as good as accountability can be sometimes. No amount of structure is going to make you avoid the things that you're prone to, is going to protect you from yourself. No amount of threatening, no amount of conjoling, no amount of rebuking is going to get you through your own stubborn heart. The only response you have is to return to the Lord God who loves you, calls you His own, adopts you into His family, gives you an inheritance you cannot believe, and calls you to be an imitator of God. Your calling, your privilege is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Doesn't leave much left, my friends. You must be all consumed by your love of God and God's love for you. Your safety is, is not to leave room for compromise, but to earnestly seek the purity and the righteousness of Christ, to imitate Him who gave Himself up for you, and to walk in the love with which He first loved you. Let's pray together.